All right. Good morning, everybody. So just a reminder to, to um, piggyback on what Mrs. Downey had said, we're going to keep the chat box silent until you've been called on to answer a question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn that off right now. All right. So today we're going to go through 3.02 positive and negative numbers, and then we will move on to 3.03, .03, the number line. And then if we have any time left, we can go through um, 3.01. I know Ms. Downey said that there were a lot of problems with greatest common factor and least common multiple, and I think the internet was cutting in and out, which made it worse. So Today we're going to go through our two lessons first. I think you'll find them pretty easy. And then if we have any questions about 3.01, we can go over that at the end. So our objective today is to know that you can use positive and negative numbers to represent quantities in the real world, to recognize the meaning and direction of positive and negative numbers, and you can explain the meaning of zero in real world situations. So we've talked about eval elevation, the measurement of the height of something. So when we talk about the elevation, and I think we all probably heard about elevation when we were talking about the hurricane coming and we were talking about people and um, their flood zones. So if you're in flood zone A or if you're in flood zone B, and that all related to their elevation and how, how, how high above sea level they were and whether they were gonna get flooded from the hurricane or not. Um, normally, we would hear about it in terms of mountains and that kind of stuff, but. With hurricanes, we definitely are concerned about elevation and how high above sea level we are. A negative number is any number that is less than zero and indicates an opposite value, written with the minus symbol, such as negative seven. So negative number just has that little minus sign in front of it, but instead of saying minus seven, we call it negative seven. And a positive number is just the opposite. It is a number greater than zero. And sometimes it has the plus symbol in front of it, but often it's just written as seven. So if it doesn't have the symbol, it's considered a positive number. And then if it has the negative sign, then it's considered a negative number. And zero is a neutral number. It is neither negative or positive. And it shows that there's no value. So it does not have any positive and it does not have any negative value. Okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna take a second to read the example and then I'm gonna call on someone to answer. When Sarah borrows $25 from her sister, her sister writes negative 25 on a paper. Sarah paid her $15 one week and her sister wrote plus 15 on the same paper. What is the meaning of positive dollars, negative dollars, and zero dollars? All right, so I've opened up the chat again. So when we have Sarah's sister, she starts off on the paper as writing negative 25. So, Ariel. Maya, you just missed the vocab. We're just starting on the first example. Ariel, and you already saw the vocab earlier, so we're good. Ariel, what does negative 25 mean? When her sister writes negative 25, what does that mean in terms of the example? And if you don't know, you can take a pass. Exactly. She owes her sister, her sister owes her $25. So, and you could also say it in a different way. You could say that her sister is down $25 now. The older sister, I'm assuming it's her older sister, the older sister is actually down $25 because she's given it to Sarah. So very good. So Sarah owes her $25. And then her sister paid her $15 one week and she wrote plus 15 on that same paper. So I'm just gonna go alphabetical. Christiana, what is that plus 15 mean? Sarah? 
So this is Christiana's question. What does the plus 15 mean on that paper? And if you don't know, you can pass or you can give us a good guess. It is up to you. Perfect. Maya, if you have a question, you may type it in the box. If you have an answer, we are working with Christiana right now. Well, she didn't pair 25, but she did pair 50. There you go. Perfect. So she's given her $15 back. So now she's, that's okay. We, I make typos all the time. So Sarah has given her sister 15 of those dollars back. So when we finally get to zero on that sheet, what will that mean? Let's see who's next. Dylan. What will zero mean when we get back to that paper and her sister writes, let's say we get to zero, what is that going to mean for the sisters? Can everybody, can, can nobody hear me or just Graceland? Okay, Graceland, can you hear me now? It is always glitchy. I'm not quite sure why. All right, make sure your volume's turned up. All right, let's see. All the teachers are glitchy. Thank you, Juan. I thought it was just mine. I'm glad to know everybody else is having the same problem. Oh, Graceland. Graceland, try maybe logging off, restarting the computer and logging back on. It must be a problem with the speakers. Or if you have headphones, try plugging in your headphones and see if that'll override the laptop speakers. It's not a great fix, but it's a quicker fix. And, oh, weird, Graceland. Dylan, can you tell us what zero dollars would mean in this example? Perfect, Dylan. Perfect, Dylan. Zero will mean that she does not owe any money. They're back to an even balance. All right, so let's move on to another example. On another winter day, winter temp on another winter day, winter temperatures were recorded. Explain the meaning of each temperature in relation to zero. Okay, so let's just look at the morning temperature of positive 5.3. Graceland, try taking the headphones. Oh. All right. So, oh, we're on Graceland. We're going to skip Graceland because she can't hear us. Juan, it's your turn. Juan, what does the morning temperature of positive 5.3 mean in relation to zero? Oh, you hear me now. Excellent, Graceland. I'm going to give you the next question, Graceland. You're going to do the afternoon temperature of zero degrees. But <clears throat> Juan, what is the morning temperature of positive 5.3 degrees Fahrenheit mean in relation to zero? Okay, there you go. It's 5.3 degrees above zero. Excellent. Graceland, what would the afternoon temperature of zero degrees mean in relation to zero? Grayson, you went to the, the nighttime temperature. That's okay. So negative 8.2 degrees Fahrenheit means that it's below zero 8.2 degrees. It is below zero. And the afternoon temperature of zero degrees is 
the same as zero. It's that middle point. It's not above, it's not below, it's the same. So you guys, <laughs> that's okay. You guys are doing excellent with positive and negative numbers. So now we have a weather woman recording temperatures, morning zero degrees Fahrenheit, afternoon positive 6.4 degrees Fahrenheit, and at night negative 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Whew, that is some cold temperatures. Which statements are true based on the recorded temperatures? So we're gonna have a choice here. So they're gonna be number one, number two, number three, or number four. You can have one right answer, two right answers, three right answers, or four right answers. So let's see. So you guys can t use the poll and answer it. I don't, does it let you pick? Uh, it doesn't let you pick more than one answer, does it? All right. All right, I don't like that. Never mind. Because there are two answers in this. Okay, so go ahead and I'm just, I'm just going to let everybody answer this one. So go ahead and type in. Type in one, two, three, or four, or you can type in one and two, one and three, one and four, whichever ones you think the right answers are, type it in this statement. Type it in the box. There we go. I see a lot of ones and fours. Very good. So that is correct. One is correct, the afternoon temperature was 6.4 degrees above the morning temperature because we see a plus there. The afternoon temperature was not six degrees below. The night temperature was 2.5 degrees below the morning temperature. So we're gonna pick number four for our second correct answer because it was not above the morning temperature, it was below. Sorry guys, I got rid of it. Okay. Okay, we've got Mount McKinley is the highest elevation and Death Valley is the lowest elevation in North America. What is the meaning of zero, positive feet, and negative feet? So our next person should be Leonardo. What is the meaning of zero in terms of our question? Oops, sorry, I had my thing. Oh, it's glitching again. So Leonardo, what does it mean when we say zero in terms of elevation? Leonardo, if you want to, you can pass. Maya and Melissa, you're going to be on for positive feet. Maya, you'll be answering what it means positive feet. And Melissa, you're going to answer what it means for negative feet. But Leonardo, you are going to tell me what does it mean? What does zero mean when we talk about elevation? And I kind of mentioned it with the hurricane. So what does zero mean?
Hold on. I'm still waiting for Leonardo to tell me what zero means. Melissa, good job. It's 282 feet under the sea level, below the sea level. Oh, no. You know what? I don't know what's going on with the sound. Every time I feel like we have a problem with the sound, I... Oh, I did put in a ticket to see if the tech people can try to figure out what's going on. All right, do we have an answer for Mount McKinley and for zero? Good job, Maya. 20,320 feet above sea level. So, Leonardo, both ladies mentioned a reference point. What is zero? Zero is that reference point, but we they they used a different word instead of zero. Okay. So we talked about the positive feet being above sea level. And we talked about the negative feet being, let me put feet here. We always want to use our measurements below sea level. What do both of these answers have in common? Both answers have something in common. All right, Graceland, I don't know what to say about the, the, the glitching, but I promise I have put in a help ticket to the tech people. Sea level. They both have sea level in common. So zero represents that sea level. It's the top, basically the top of the ocean, the, the sea level. So anything below sea level would be inside the ocean. And anything above sea level would be dry because it would not be in the ocean. So when we talked about the hurricane, we talked about how high our homes were above sea level. And some homes are only two or three feet above sea level. Some homes are 30 or 40 feet above sea level. So when we are talking about sea level and floods, we want to make sure our home is above where the flood is coming. And it is neutral, Juan. Very good. All right, so we have already finished 3.02. We're going to move on to 3.03, .03, the number line. So after this, you should be able to say that you can locate a number and its opposite on a number line. I know 3.02 .02 and 3.03 .03 are pretty easy. Um, you're also going to be able to determine that an opposite of an opposite is itself. And that may not make sense right now, but we'll do it later. And you will also be able to find and position numbers on horizontal and vertical number lines. Yes, Melissa, your house is nine feet above sea level. So, you know, let's say here's your house. And let's say this is nine feet. And here's the ocean. Okay, so this distance is how high above the water you are. So if we have a flood that is 10 feet and it's a 10 foot flood, you're going to have one foot of water in your house. I know, I'm an artist. Thank you. <laughs> I draw very badly, but at least you guys can understand what I'm talking about. All right, so we have. Four new vocabulary words. So we have a coordinate, which is just a number used to indicate the position of a point. So when we say the coordinate, it is basically just a point, but it's the number where that point is. An integer is a whole number, a negative whole number, and zero or zero. 
So you could have negative 405, negative 31, zero, positive 15, positive 23, positive 6,000. As long as it's a whole number, positive or negative or zero, then it counts. Remember, zero is neither positive nor negative. So zero is not a positive number. It is not a negative number. It is just a number. Then we have the number line, which is typically a straight line. And if you think this isn't straight, you should go get your eyes checked. <laughs> Just kidding, it's not a straight line. But it usually has tick marks along it, usually evenly spaced, to show the different locations of numbers. You could have a vertical number line. Okay, and then rational numbers. Oh, Graceland, it's again a glitch with the computer. I do not have a really high-pitched voice, so I think, again, it's, it's something with the internet that's, that's messing up my voice and messing up the, the glitches. But I did put in a help ticket, so hopefully they will fix it. And our last vocab word is a rational number, a number that can be written as a ratio of two numbers. This includes all integers fractions and decimals that terminate. Terminate is just a fancy word for end. Okay, a number that can be written as a ratio of two numbers. This includes integers, fractions, and decimals that have an end. Remember there's decimals like that kind of go on and on forever and ever and ever. That is not a rational number. But if I just had 1.3 and no repeating numbers, then that terminates, that ends, and that would be a rational number. Christiana, you may go if you, if you want. If you have any questions, you can always come back and watch the recording later. All right, so here is a number line. What is the coordinate for point A. And we can negative six. Very good, Juan. Maya, good job. So A equals negative six. Okay, go ahead, someone, and tell me what the coordinate for B would be. Three, very good, positive three. But again, we don't have to write the positive sign. It's just three. See, these chapters are so easy for you guys. Okay, so please explain. So explain means that there should be some sort of words or sentence. Explain the point's location from zero. So this little triangle, explain that point compared to zero. It's 30 above zero or 30 exactly it's above zero or to the right of zero above any of those would work very good so we have rational numbers on our number line now we have negative one and a half negative one, zero, positive one half, and two. This number line is created so that each tick mark represents a value of one half. The way you make your number line is up to you as long as you label it correctly and choose appropriate values for the tick marks. So this isn't really a question. This is just to show you that there's lots of different ways to make a number line but you wanna make sure that you stay consistent with your tick marks and that you label it correctly, okay? So that is your, your job is to, you know, normally, you know, normally sometimes we have tick marks that kind of have zero and then we just do one, two, three. That might be a common number line that you've seen in the past, but this is showing us that we can have half 
mark tick marks. And then the other page that we were just on was showing us that we could even count by tens. Maya, we only have a couple more slides and we should be done. So an example, on the number line below, notice that in the space between each of the integers, there are three tick marks. These divide the space into four equal parts so that each tick mark is one fourth distance away from the others. Each tick mark is not labeled, so you would have to do some calculating. So what is the coordinate for point P? Oh, Maya, very good, three fourths. All right, so we have one tick mark, two tick mark, three tick marks, but there were four total. So this is three out of four. This would be two out of four. This would be one out of four. Phew, very good. What if I had a point right here? point Q. Fractions are friends. Very good, Juan. Three and one half. Uh, hold on. And what if I had point R? What would point R be? Very good, negative two and one fourth. You guys make this look so easy. All right, so on the number line, identify the value of the coordinate and the location of the point that is opposite of that coordinate. So let's start with just this one right here. What is that point? Three and one fourth. Just, we're just starting with the, the red arrow. We're just starting with the red arrow. Don't worry about the opposite yet. Don't worry about the opposite yet. I just want you to look at the red arrow. Just look at the red arrow for right now. It says we're just focused on identify the value of the coordinate. So right now, the coordinate is at that red little arrow, and it is 3 and 1 fourth. Are we all okay with the red arrow? Perfect. Now it wants to find the point that is opposite of three and one fourth. So what would be the opposite of positive three and one fourth? Graceland, very good. The opposite point would be negative three and one fourth. So Ariel, it's, it's three and one fourth and negative three and one fourth. Three fourths would be over here, but we're at the one fourth mark. And it, you can label these, it really helps if we label them. All right, Juan, have a great day. All right, we have one slide left. Is everyone okay with the opposite? We really just changed the sign because it's, it's okay, perfect. All right. So what is the value of negative, negative 6.7? So in words, we would say, what is the opposite of the opposite of 6.7? Six point seven, very good. Very good. And that's it. Do we have oh whoop whoop? So Maya, when we do the opposite. 
Hold on one second. Let's see. Let me do, let me see if I can grab another practice question real quick. Okay. Okay. Let's take away these words real quick. Let's go to questions. Okay. What is, so we have the number four. What is the opposite of positive four? The opposite of positive four is negative four. What if I wanted the opposite of negative four? What is the opposite of negative four? Positive four. Very good. So all it was really asking us was to find the opposite of negative 6.7, which, so if we had a negative opposite of a negative 7.5, the opposite of negative 7.5, it's the same number, but the sign changed. I don't, I think it's, I think it was meaning to say the opposite of, the opposite, I think it was trying to say the opposite of negative 6.7 and instead of using negative it said opposite. I didn't, I didn't like that. I didn't like that they said opposite of the opposite, but it's the opposite of negative 6.7, the opposite of negative 7.5, the opposite of a positive 4.2. I, I think that's easier to understand. I, I think it's confusing to say the opposite of the opposite. So that's why I wanted to switch that real quick. So <laughs> perfect, but you're basically just changing the, the sign basically, yeah. So does anyone wanna go over 3.1, whoops, do we want to review, Gracelyn, oh my goodness, can anyone else hear me, Melissa, can you hear, um, Yeah, yeah, let's see. Next time. Okay. So, does anyone want to go over and review 3.01 least common multiple and greatest common factor? 3.01 and 3.02 are over. All right, so we have, I mean, really, we could go for another 20 minutes and just review. Yes, if you, Maya, if you are very comfortable with, three, with um, least common multiple and greatest common factor, you can leave. If you want an, a little extra review or if you want to stay and help, it is completely up to you. The, the lesson is over. This is just for people who want an extra practice on least common multiple and greatest common factor. All right. So, does anyone have any specific questions or would you like me to just put up a, a problem and we could work on it?
All right. Graceland, I'm so sorry. I'm such a loud speaker. You got to meet me someday so you know my voice isn't high pitched and you know that I'm not a whisperer. I'm a very loud talker. But <laughs> for now, I wonder if maybe the recording will be better. Um, let's see. All right. Let me find a good problem. So let's do. All right. Hold on. Let's do the greatest common factor for 24 and oh, 28. So before we begin, what does greatest common factor mean? What are we looking for when we look for the greatest common factor? No, I'm not speaking. I was, well, I did ask a question. Hold on, let's see. Sure, hold on one second. Okay, so I want to know what does greatest common factor mean? What does greatest common factor mean? What are we looking for when we look for the greatest common factor? What multiples with both to get the answer? Um, I, you're close. I think we're we're just using um, uh, by Leonardo. Okay, so factor is your key word here. A factor is a number that goes into another number. So if I say um, 2 times 3 equals 6, 2 is a factor, and 3 is a factor. We're going to do a problem, Maya. Yes, we're going to do a problem, but I want to make sure we understand before we get into the problem, I want to make sure we understand how to, how to, like, what we're doing. So a factor is a number. This is a factor. This is a factor. These are factors. So we are looking for a number that goes into 24 and a number that goes into 28. So we are looking for a number that goes into 24 and a number that goes into 28. Graceland, I don't see you. I only see what I have on the board right now. I, I want to make sure we're all looking at what's on the board. So um, uh, let me clear all this off again. All right. Okay. And so we're looking for a factor, but we're looking for the biggest number that goes into 24 and 28. So I really like the prime factorization, the factor tree. So let's. What goes into 24? I don't want to jump to the answer, guys. I do not want to jump to the answer. I want to know what goes into 24. I want to do a factor tree. Okay, so let's start with just one number. I like to keep it simple. I know that 2 goes into 24 12 times. I know that 2 goes into 12 6 times. And I know that 2 goes into 6 3 times. So my factors of 24 
are two, 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 and three. Yay! Hold on, Melissa. I, I, I want to walk through the first one just to make sure everybody understands it, and then I'll, I'll let you guys do a practice. Okay, so the same with 28. I'm going to start with two. I know that two goes into 28 14 times. I know that two goes into 14 seven times. And I really don't have anything for seven. So 28 is going to be two, two, seven. Now, okay, now I will let you draw on the board. Can someone, so can someone tell me what we do next? Maya, go ahead. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to circle the factors that they both share. All right, so Maya, very good. You have to see which factors are the same in both groups. So notice how I lined up my factors for 24. I really want you guys looking down here right now, okay? I'm gonna take off the writing privileges because we're not focused, okay. So, oh, I don't know why someone just wrote. Let's see, let's get rid of that. Okay. So if you'll notice, okay, can't get rid of this person's mark. Okay, if you'll notice in this, in this red box down in the bottom, I listed all the factors of 24 and I listed all the factors of 28. Hold on one second, guys. Sorry guys, sorry guys, Mrs. Downey just popped in and said hi. Okay. Okay, sorry guys. Um, all right, so we circled what we had in common. We circled a two that they had in common and then they had another two in common. And now all we're gonna do is multiply one, two from each of those groups to find our greatest common factor is four. Good job, Melissa. 
So once you do your two factor trees and you line up your numbers, you're just going to circle the common ones and multiply one of those numbers from each circle. All right, any questions with greatest common factor? We're going to move on to least common multiple real quick because I know we're running out of time. Um, let's see. Let's see, there we go. I like this one better. Um, okay. No questions? All right. So let's move on to least common. All right. Least common multiple. <clears throat> so now a multiple and least. Okay, so we're finding the smallest number that both of these numbers can go into. So I'm going to use 9 and 12. Exactly. It's the greatest number that can go into both numbers, and this is the least number that can be that these can both go into. But it can be tricky because again, but um and here's the other thing that's tricky about least common multiple. You're looking, even though it says least, your answer. Let me just type this because that's going to be too much, too much handwriting. Let me see. Okay. So even though it says least common multiple, the answer <clears throat> will be uh, the biggest number or it could be bigger than the biggest number. Oh my goodness, Gracelyn, I'm plug and plug it back in. <clears throat> and for greatest common factor, the answer will be the smaller than both numbers will be the smallest number type today number or it could be smaller than the smallest number okay Okay. <clears throat> okay. So if this doesn't make any sense, let's let's just so the least common multiple is either going to be the biggest number of the two or bigger than the biggest number. The greatest common factor is going to be the smallest number of the two or it could be smaller than the smallest number. So let's I'm going to just whoops. All right. So again, we want to do the prime factorization for 9, which is 3 and 3, and 12, which is 2, 2, and 3. So we're going to write it over here. Yes, I am talking. All right, so then, well, this is a bad example. <laughs> we're just going to circle what they, oh, no, this is a good example. We're going to circle what they have in common, which in this case is just one, three. They have one, three in common. And then we're going to multiply all the numbers together except we're only going to use one of the circled numbers. So we're going to do 3 times 3 times 2 times 2. So what is 3 times 3 times 2 times 2?
36. Very good. And this is going to be our least common multiple. Okay, so what I have typed down in the bottom, it may be confusing, but if, it, if you understand it, I would write it in your notes because it really is going to be a nice hint to help you remember um, to help you remember that the greatest common factor is actually small and the least common multiple is actually big. Um, so it, it's kind of confusing in that sense. Let's try. I want to try something bigger. Let's see. Let me see. I, I want to get to. Hmm. All right. Okay, Ariel, no problem. I'm going to clear off the slide soon. So make um, so give me a thumbs up if you're still writing. All right, copy everything down and we'll go through a couple more examples. Good job, Melissa. Oh, that's a good idea. Very good. Let's move on because we are kind of over time here and I want to make sure that we got time. So take a screenshot, take a picture with your phone. I would like to go over some more examples, but once I go back, this whole slide disappears. So take a screenshot. Good job. All right. So let's do the least common multiple of four and 10. Oh no, Melissa. That's all right. I'm sure Ariel or Graceland can send you a picture of it. I'm sorry. I thought I had every. Melissa, you gave me a thumbs up. You gave me two thumbs up, Melissa. Did you get it? Did you get it written down? So let's. That's okay, we're gonna go through more examples. Are we comfortable with doing the prime factorization? I know I go through it really quickly. Um, and I really do it because it's, it's, I always just divide by that smaller number. Gracelyn, what's the question? I want you, I'm going to show, this is my second example for least common multiple. Can you hear me again? This is my second example for least common multiple. So we're, I'm going to show you one more time and then I'm going to have you do. Oh, I will show, whoops. Got to get you, Grayson, we got to get your computer looked at. All right. So to find the least common multiple, we're going to multiply one 
of these twos, just one, and then we're going to multiply the other numbers. Two times two times five. What do we get when we multiply two times two times five? Very good. So the least common multiple is 20. Four can go into 20 and 10 can go into 20. All right, so I'm going to clear off the screen and let's, I'm going to have you find a least common multiple for the numbers um, 8 and oh, what do I want to use? What do I want to use? Um, 8 and 18. So go ahead and find the prime factorization for 8 and the prime factorization for 18 and find the least common multiple for 8 and the least common multiple, I'm sorry, find the prime factorization for 8, find the prime factorization for 18 and then let's find the least common multiple. Yeah, Graceland, I really think you might want to call the office and let them know what's happening to your computer because nobody else, even though I'm glitchy for everybody else, they at least could hear me. So I think you should call the office and let them know what's happening to your computer and see if they can. So. Ariel, would you like to do the prime factorization for 8 on the board? And Melissa, would you do the prime factorization for 18 on the board? Ooh, Mel who's doing, I don't know who's working on this, but it looks like two, two people are working on this. Melissa should be doing 18. Okay. Okay, Melissa, go ahead. Gracelyn, I'm going to have you um, do the, the least common multiple part. Ariel, when you're done, will you do it in a list like I had it where I put the eight and then I listed all the numbers after it? Mm, Melissa, 12 does not go into 18. I love to start with two for any even number. Just use the number two. Oh, there you go. Just use the number two because you know that it's an even number. Don't circle the four, Ariel. So, mm, hold on, two times six, okay, hold on, two times nine is 18, there we go. Okay, 
So Ariel, what I wanted is this, kind of where you do the eight and then you list just the prime numbers. Four is not a prime number. I just want the ones that, the, kind of like the, the branches, not the trunk, but just kind of like the dead ends. I don't want the in the middle stuff. All right, and then for 18, we've got two, three, three. Oh, okay. <laughs> no problem, Ariel. It's hard to see who does what. So now, Gracelyn, I want you to tell me what do we do with this information here? And we, we don't need to do the ones, the ones. Okay, so Gracelyn, what do we circle in this box? What should we circle to do our, our next step? You want to find the number that they have in common on the top, the twos. Very good. So we're going to circle one of those twos. And then this one doesn't have a partner. This one doesn't have a partner. This one doesn't have a partner. And this one does not have a partner. So we're going to multiply two times two times two times three times three. What is our least common multiple? Notice I only used three of the twos. I can't use both of the twos when there's one in the top and one in the bottom. I can only use one two from that circle. I can't use both twos. So we've got two times two times two times three times three. What is two times two times two times three times three? So two times two is four, four times two is eight. I don't know why we keep writing a nine here. I keep deleting it, someone keeps writing it. So two times two is four, four times two is eight, eight times three is 24, and 24 times three is 72. All right, we're going to take those privileges away again because we're doing a little too much writing. All right. All right, Graceland, can you hear me again? Okay, so I have two times two, which is four. Four times two is eight. Eight times three is 24. 24 times three is 72. Or you could even do two times two is four, four times two is eight. Okay, so you know that the twos are all eight. That's eight. And you know three times three is nine. Eight times nine is 72. So again, when we do a factor tree, and I'm just going to pick a big number right now. Okay, I'm going to pick 72. We just did 72. I don't want to pick difficult numbers to go into 72. I know it ends in an even number, so it's divisible by 2. So let's do 72 divided by 2. Okay, so that's 36. 36 ends in an even number, so I know it's divisible by 2. And just in case you don't know that it's 18, we can do the math. And then it gets smaller so we can start doing the easy stuff. So the prime factorization for 72 is 2, 2, 2, 3, 
three. <clears throat> so don't make the factor tree harder than it needs to be. If it's an even number, <clears throat> divide it by two and then figure out what the opposite would that, you know, what the other factor would be. Um, if it ends in zero or five, divide it by 10 or by five. Keep it super simple so that that factor tree is easy for you. Now let's try greatest common factor for 20, let's do greatest common factor for 20 and 36. All right. So again, Ariel, <clears throat> why don't you take 36 this time? Melissa, you take 20. And you guys can go ahead and do your, your factor trees. It's multiplication. 10 times 10 is 100. 10 times 10 is not 20. Whoops. Hold on. We're not adding. We are multiplying. So these two numbers have to multiply together to be 20. Okay, so we're not adding, we're multiplying. So that level, the 10 and the 2, have to multiply to get 20. Does that, nay, no problem. Very good, two and 18. Two is done, two is, is kind of a, a dead branch. We can't take two down any further, very good. Five times four is 20. What do we multiply by five to get 10? Very good. So it's going to be five and two. Ariel, you can take that nine down a little bit more. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that makes more sense. All right. So we have 20 is all these little dead branches here, two, two, five. <laughs> it's really hard to write on the board, isn't it? Looks like it would be easy, but it's not. And then for 36, we have two, two, three, three. So then again, we circle the ones that they have in common, <clears throat> but here's where it's different than the least common multiple. In the least common multiple, we multiplied all the numbers together, except we only used one of the twos from one circle and one of the twos from the second circle. In greatest common factor, we're only using the circles. And again, we're only using one of the twos from one circle and one of the twos and one of the twos from the other circle. So our greatest common factor is four. Four can go into 20 and four can go into 36. So do you see the difference between, can you see the difference between, um, All right, I'm also submitting another report. 
to let them know that I'm, I'm submitted two reports to two different people about the volume or about the speakers. Okay. So any specific questions on greatest common factor or least common multiple? Good job, guys. So you have enough information to do 3.01, 3.02, 3.03, and I think 3.04 is a quiz. So you could even move ahead and do your quiz this week, even though I think it's not due till next week. So you guys are off to a great start. Let Mrs. Downey know if there's any problems or questions. And um, Gracelyn, if you're still there, let's find out what's going on with your computer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if anyone, I don't know who's still on here, you guys have a great day. Thanks for participating. Bye, everybody.